group said, we would like for you and your wife to stay for a Bible study after the potluck. And my wife and I said, great. What a great way to spend Sunday. You know, after potluck, a Bible study. So, they put the chairs together after the, for the Bible study, after potluck. And the first elder, Anglo, and his wife made a few opening comments. And they said, uh, this is what we're going to be studying. And so they handed out these little booklets. And so I, first thing I do when someone hands me a book to read, I look at the table of contents. And it was a book written by a former Church of God minister. It was a study on the importance of observing the festivals. You ever hear about Adventists there observing the festivals? And their opening remarks included, unless we Seventh-day Adventists go back to observing the festivals, the Mosaic ordinances, we will be lost. So, I stood up and I said, thank you for the invitation. I'm familiar with this book. Oh, you are? I said, yes. This is a book prepared by the Church of God organization. Oh, it's not. And I said, do you have a computer handy? I have a laptop right here. Google Church of God Bible Study Course. And count from study number 9 down to 15 how many times the Church of God includes the festivals the festivals as a key to understanding how God wants for us to relate to Him and in order to be saved. And they did. And there it was. Well, we're going to study it anyway. That's your choice. But we're leaving. Well, what guidelines do you have to prove? And I said, you just looked at it in your computer. This is directly from the Church of God. Would you be interested in what Ellen White says about it? Yes. Do you accept Ellen White as a legitimate, inspired vehicle of God? Absolutely. So this is what I read to them. Quote, Are we wise virgins, or must we be classed among the foolish? That which passes with many for the religion of Christ is made up of ideas, theories, a mixture of truth and error. Some are trying to become good enough to be saved. Penances, mortifications of the flesh, constant confession of sin without sincere repentance. Another list. Fasts, festivals, and outward observances unaccompanied by true devotion all of these are of no value whatever. The sacrifice of Christ is sufficient. Desire of Ages, page 308. A failure to appreciate the value of the offering of Christ has a debasing influence. It leads us to receive unsound and perilous theories concerning the salvation that has been purchased for us at infinite cost. Amen. Review and Herald. August 19, 1890. A week later, she writes another statement. By the way, you can also find that last statement in Evangelism, page 192, the first paragraph. Here's the second statement a week later. The reason why the churches are weak and sickly and ready to die is that the enemy has brought influences of a discouraging nature to bear upon the trembling souls. He has sought to shut Jesus from the view as their comforter, as one who reproves, who warns, who admonishes than saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. Last sentence. Satan has achieved his greatest success through interposing himself
between the soul and the Savior. Yeah. What is your reference? The last one is revealed in Hebrews 13, 1 through 6, 1890, page 513. The one before was Review and Herald, August 19, 1890, and also in Evangelism, page 192. First paragraph. So this is where we are today. We have first elders teaching senior adult Sabbath school classes, teaching people that unless they observe the festivals, they will not be saved. There have been and continue to be such attacks regarding the gospel. And these attacks will continue because of a failure to understand this, the spiritual symbolism of circumcision 2,000 years ago. And today, not understanding the biblical meaning of the word sanctification. Sanctification, what, let's begin, let's go back. What does the word grace mean? Where did we learn the, the definition of the, word, of the word grace from Scripture? Forgiveness unwarranted. It's a divine influence on the heart and then a reflection of that. Exactly correct. Right out of the concordance. The divine influence on the human heart, which means that the human heart is receptive, or it could not be influenced even by divinity. The divine influence on the human heart and then its reflection out. That is the biblical definition of the word grace. What is the visual? What is the visual definition of the word sanctification? Let's look at it. Let's take a look at Romans 6. We already looked at this last week. Well, the week before, I think it was last week. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. What a chapter. Romans chapter 6. In verse 16, we learn that since Adam and Eve decided to become self-dependent instead of God-dependent, the human race has become absolutely 100% helpless. And we only have two choices in life. You can choose to become a slave to Satan, or you can choose to become a slave to Christ. If you choose to become a slave to Christ, this or these are the rewards. Who would like to read verse 22 of Romans 6? Romans 6, 22, right over here. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your proof to holiness and the end of everlasting life. Thank you. Some translations use the word, the fruit to holiness is sanctification. But that's good, what you just read. That's good. So, the moment that I choose to become a slave to Christ, God guarantees what? Holiness and everlasting life. What is my participation in this? Submission. How about, yes, thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Will that work? Yes. In Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul describes his understanding of circumcision and its relationship to the ceremonial law and also makes a very descriptive gives a very descriptive opinion on the false brethren that were teaching a counterfeit gospel and the relationship between circumcision and salvation. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. We're all familiar with Romans chapter 7 where Paul describes the issues of his life now that he's been converted to Christianity. Here in chapter 3, Paul is telling us, describing himself to us when he was a Pharisee, unconverted. 
obviously he's converted when he's writing it, but what he's relating to us is his mindset before he was converted. Philippians chapter 3, beginning with verse 2. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the what? Mutilation. False circumcision. Yep. The physical mutilation. How's that for descriptive? Verse 3. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence where? In the flesh. Although I myself, verse 4, might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more than anyone else. 5. Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and as to the law, a Pharisee. Six, and as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to the righteousness which is from the law, I was found blameless. And seven, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. So what is the relationship between circumcision and salvation? According to scripture, when was Abraham really, really circumcised? Who would like to read Romans 4, verse 10, 11, and 12 for us? Romans 4, verses 10, 11, and 12. According to scripture, when was Abraham really circumcised? Volunteer over here. circumcision was never anything more than what? A visual sign of the real circumcision of the heart. So when we are experiencing the circumcision of the heart, the visual circumcision becomes what? Unnecessary. But if the circumcision of the heart is absent, then what does the physical circumcision become? No, nothing. A fraud. Yeah. Hypocrisy. Good. Okay. <laughs> the, the, when you asked before what does circumcision have to do with salvation, you said zero. But the scripture says we are the circumcision. And but what kind of circumcision is the scripture speaking of? Well, you pointed to a part of your body. Right, but but it's also not just our heart, but it's the new life in Christ. Because the flesh that Paul was talking about that you just read, he had no confidence in this fallen flesh. So John says, he that hath the son hath life. So it's this life that God has given to us. That's what circumcision represents. So you're right, it's a fraud if we try to gain that by some act, but we can't. We can only receive it by faith. Mm -hmm. But circumcision does have something to do with our salvation. It has to do with the life that Christ has given to us at an infinite cost to us. Okay, when you use the word circumcision, brother, are you talking about the spiritual circumcision or the physical circumcision about that has something to do with our salvation? I'm talking about, it says in the midst of the week, the Messiah shall be cut off in Daniel. That word cut off is the same word used for circumcision. And so when Christ died on the cross, humanity died. That humanity did not raise from the grave. That's the circumcision. It's the new life in Christ. That's what we are. 
That's what this is given to us. Yes, no question about that. That's we're talking here about the difference between the physical and the spiritual circumcision. That's what Paul is talking about in Philippians, Philippians chapter 3. Sure. So what I'm talking about is what Paul is talking about. So am I. <laughs> so when we use the word circumcision, we cannot use it without an explanation that the circumcision that is only valid in the sight of God is the spiritual circumcision and not the physical. Yeah. Are we clear on that? Yes. yes. Okay. So, the false brethren were substituting an empty sign for the reality. What does Jesus say about all of this regarding the activities of the flesh? Who would like to read John 6, 63? John 6, verse 63. trusted in Paul's gospel of salvation through Christ. Now, these false brethren were coming in and teaching them and inducing them to trust in what? The flesh. Did the false brethren teach the new converts that it was okay now to sin? No. Satan is too clever to be that obvious. Still today, he is. What did they teach them? Paul had taught them that what was given to Abraham as a sign of righteousness by faith, they must now earn through self-righteousness. Who is missing in this gospel? Christ. Again, Christ was not enough. Who is influencing the false brethren to teach the Galatian converts not to trust in the outward, not to trust in the Holy Spirit, the circumcision of the heart, rather than in the outward form of circumcision and substituting the work of the Holy Spirit? Who was teaching that? The circumcision party. The Pharisees that believed. Who is behind all this? Satan. Right. How many forces do we have in life? Two. One of the two you're going to respond to. Let me read it to you from Acts of the Apostles, page 387. Quote, It is Satan's studied effort to divert minds from the hope of salvation through faith in Christ and obedience to the law of God. In every age, the arch enemy adapts his temptations to the prejudices or inclinations of those whom he is seeking to deceive. End quote. Again, Acts of the Apostles, page 387. According to Scripture, whatever does not proceed from faith is what? Sin. Romans 14, 13. Therefore, all of my sincere efforts to keep the law by my own power can only result in what? Failure. Which leads to what? Mindset. Bondage. Bondage is sin, folks. And that is how Satan gets us to sin. By appealing to our natural nature. What is my natural nature? I don't know about your nature, but my sinful nature wants to go to heaven. Not on God's terms, but on my sinful nature's terms. So, Satan steps in and says, Chuck, no problem, I have a counterfeit for you. He doesn't call it a counterfeit. Mm -hmm. But it's going to appeal to your what? Because yeah. my sinful nature does not want to die to self. My sinful nature wants to distribute food to the homeless, clothes to the poor. Is that bad? No. no. Absolutely not. But that's what my sinful nature likes to do because it makes me feel good after I do it. But my sinful nature does not want to what? God itself. He doesn't want to go into the gate. And that's what the cross is all about. The cross is not about Jesus' physical suffering. 
No one is going to be willing to be crucified unless they first have died to self, subordinated the will to God. No one is going to be willing to be stoned to death, as Stephen was, and as he's being stoned to death, Acts 7, 60, saying, Lord, do not, do not hold this against them. That are murdering me, stoning me to death. That cannot happen until he first died to self. Haas and Jerome cannot possibly sing songs of praise to God while they're burning at the stake unless they had first subordinated their will to God and died to self. The human body just won't do that. Do we understand that? That's the issue. There is no other issue. Galatians chapter 2 and 15 tell us that Paul and Barnabas and a couple of other people went to Jerusalem for the Jerusalem Council because the brethren in Antioch said, look, we cannot deal with this problem, with this issue of circumcision. You need to go to the brethren in Jerusalem and speak specifically, directly, face to face with Peter, James, and John. And so, Paul and Barnabas did. Paul says, says something very interesting. Though. Galatians chapter 2, verse 2. Who would like to read that again? Galatians chapter 2, verse 2. Paul says, yes, I will go because I want to work within the system. The brethren have said you need to go to Jerusalem. But what does Paul say in Galatians 2, verse 2? I went up there by what? Revelation. The revelation of God, not because of the brethren telling you should go. Because it's my gospel, my gospel being the gospel that Christ had taught him, that's brought about this issue. This issue never came up before. Now, what does Paul add in Galatians chapter 2, verse 6? I love this. Who would like to read that? Lois. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run, or had run, in vain. Verse 6. Verse 6. Galatians 2, verse 6. Okay. But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man, for those who seem to be something added nothing to me. Well, when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of someone, they almost get a little arrogant and cocky, don't they? Huh? Yeah. I'm not going up there to learn anything. I will go up there and meet with Peter, James, and John, but I'm not going up there to learn anything because who has taught me the gospel? Christ himself. Yeah. What is the lesson for us, hopefully, in all of this? <clears throat> Anytime that God inspires a person to write about a certain topic, any member of the human race that comes and endorses it is an impertinence. God doesn't need an endorsement for any member of the human race on what is inspired. Amen. What's an impertinence? Uh -huh. Something that is absolutely irrelevant. It's pointless. You know, if you forget everything that I'm trying to get across here, that's fine. Please understand this last point. If you believe that the Word of God is inspired, any endorsement by another, by a member of the human race is an absolute impertinence. When people ask me, Chuck, what is your opinion about this biblical topic? I say, I have no opinion to about it. What? Well, because I believe this is inspired. Doesn't God have enough problem dealing in the Protestant world with over 70 different versions of the gospel? That's what I'm told we have in the Protestant world. Approximately 70 different versions. Denominations, And that doesn't include the independent ministries, of which we have in the double digits. We being the Seventh-day Adventist Church. No, I have no opinions on the Bible. Actually, what the leaders in Jerusalem 
Peter, James, and John really needed to hear was the gospel that Jesus had taught Paul. Yes. What the new converts in Galatia needed to hear was that the brethren in Jerusalem were 100% in agreement with the yes. gospel that Paul had been teaching. Would that be a good idea today? Yeah, yeah. Wow. And they also needed to hear that the brethren in Jerusalem are 100% on the gospel that Paul is preaching and we're in complete unity that this is the gospel that needs to be spread all over the country. After the issues were thoroughly discussed in Jerusalem, Peter stands up and he makes a statement. Let's take a look at it. Let's read it. Acts 15, verse 10 and 11. Who would like to read Acts 15, verse 10 and 11? Volunteer? Okay. Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Thank you. Now, after that statement, then James, Jesus' brother, stands up. And he says something in verses 19 and 20. Who would like to read Acts 15, 19 and 20? Okay, Mary Jane. Therefore I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from things strangled, and from blood. Thank you. Now, everyone said amen back then? Yeah. And so they drafted a letter. Acts 15, 23 to 29. And they said, this letter is to be universally accepted and proclaimed or shared wherever the gospel is being presented. They were also assured that circumcision was not binding upon the new converts and that these people that had come to Galatia, converting Pharisees to Christianity, had not been authorized by the brethren in Jerusalem to teach such a thing, and never would be. What's the lesson for us here? Don't there is anything. nothing that you and I can do to add in quantity or quality to what Christ has already obtained for us. Amen. Nothing. The gospel is the power of God to salvation, not the power of man. Amen. It might be interesting to you to look up the word, and the pastor's preached on this. His scripture was five Sabbath, the first Sabbath in August. His scripture was Romans 1, 16 and 17. You should look up in your concordance how the word power is spelled in the Greek. Dunamos. What does that phonetically sound like? <laughs> so the only way to be lost is for me to take the initiative and say, no thank you, Jesus. I need more or I want more. Is it really time to stop? <sighs> Did the leaders in Jerusalem perceive the Holy Spirit working through Paul? Yes. And so what did they do? They extended the right hand of fellowship to Paul and Barnabas. Mm -hmm. The clearest sign that you're experiencing the influence of the Holy Spirit in your life is when you recognize the Holy Spirit working in someone else's life.
The opposite of that is that the surest evidence that you do not have the Holy Spirit influence in your life is when you see the Holy Spirit working in someone else's life and you don't recognize it. And what does that produce? Envy? Jealousy? Fault finding? Many professed Christians believe that it's a natural thing for us to have dissensions in the church. 